Pardon the interruption, but I'm Mike Wilbon. Tony, scientists say a recent landslide in Greenland shook the Earth for nine days. And Tony Kornheiser, oh, I thought it was because I trimmed my beard. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, I don't know what you mean. I don't even get that. Really? I don't, I don't know what that you means. Don't. What are you talking about? Because you trimmed your beard, the Earth I'm... shook? What? Yeah. I don't know. No. I read what's up there. How many times have I said to you I'm a show monkey? <laughs> if you put something up there, I'm going to read it. All right. I just read it. I'm I thought it was all right. Movie. Welcome to PTI, boys and girls. Today's episode, Kirk Cousins is struggling. The Pac-12 is back, and Booger McFarland joins us for five good minutes. But we begin today with tonight's Thursday night game, Buffalo at Miami. These are two teams with big offenses, but neither has gotten to the Super Bowl lately. Dolphins haven't won a playoff game since 2000. Buffalo has beaten Miami in 11 of their past 12 meetings. Wilbon, do the Dolphins have to beat the Bills for you to take them seriously as a legit power team? Well, Tony, they got to beat them at least once this year, and they get two cracks at them. So they may as well, you know, start tonight. I mean, 11 out of 12. I mean, I thought the only team that owned another division team like that right now was the Packers over the My Bears. I thought that was the only one. Yeah. I didn't realize that. And, you know, I mean, Tua, I think, is one in six against the Bills. So, yes, yeah. you, you've got to establish something in your division. It's not like you're getting beat like this by Tom Brady and Bill Belichick, which, you know, was the first half of the century, the first, you know, 10 years anyway of this century. So, no, the Dolphins have got to be better at this started tonight. And there's no reason. I mean, you, you got, you know, a, a situation where Buffalo's big star, their superstar, has got an injured wrist. I know it's his left wrist not his throwing hand. But still, man, you're going to take advantage of some of this now. And if you don't get this one, then you've got to get the next one or you have a really reduced chance of winning your division. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I don't think it's just the 11 out of 12. I think it's the Josh Allen factor. He is personally 10-2 and two against Miami. But in those games, he's got like 33 touchdown passes, only seven interceptions. He he's rushed them. for 638 yards and five touchdowns, and it's, I understand that it's not just against Mike McDaniel coach Dolphin teams, but he's 4-1 and one against him, including a playoff game, and as you mentioned, Tua is 1-6 and six against Buffalo. To, to stress what you're saying, this is the division. You cannot be taken seriously as no. a conference contender no. if you cannot do better in your own division. When I look at the AFC now, at the top I have Kansas City, and then I have Baltimore. Right now, Houston may be rising. It's possible that the Chargers with Jim Harbaugh are rising. The Steelers with a new quarterback may be rising. Is there room for Buffalo and Miami? I'm not sure. I'm not sure there's room for both of them, right? Yeah, I'm not sure about Pittsburgh yet. I'm not sure about San Diego yet. No, it's possible. So it's possible. It is. Pittsburgh yet. I'm not sure about San Diego yet. No, it's possible. So it, it is. It possible. is. You're right. No, no, you're entirely right. But Buffalo and Miami should look at those two and say, no, 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 no. No, no, no. And we didn't mention Cincinnati. So Buffalo well, and Miami can, can, should look at those other teams other than Kansas City and Baltimore and say, give me some elbow room. But that's why, Tony, yeah. I hate to start talking about how big a game is in week two. I think this is fairly big, especially for those Thursday night dog games is usually what we get. The Falcons could soon face a quarterback quandary. Kirk Cousins looked lousy in last week's loss to the Steelers, showing little strength in that surgically repaired right Achilles. Atlanta agreed to pay Cousins $100 million, guaranteed, as you know. If he struggles again Monday night in Philly tone, could you see the Falcons turning this quickly to rookie first-round pick Michael Penix Jr.? So they have a new coach in Atlanta, new offensive coordinator in Atlanta, Zach Robinson. I don't know what their loyalty is to Kirk Cousins. I don't know if they were involved in signing Kirk Cousins or that was just the owner. I know it's $180 million overall and $100 million guaranteed. And I also know that if I'm the owner, I don't want to sit $100 million guaranteed on the bench this quickly. I, I mean, I would not want to do that. He's got... The torn Achilles from last year. You don't know how fully healthy he is. Have the coaches reached out to try to give him a comfort level? It is said that Cousins likes to take snaps directly under center, and I guess they moved him back into back a shotgun. In shotgun. This yeah. could be as much. This could be as much coaching 
as it is Cousins, similar to what you said last year about Russell Wilson in Denver. Kirk Cousins is 36 years old. He's been a starter, Mike, in the league for 10 years. He's a known commodity. Maybe you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Well, Maybe Tony, you can. I looked at that, and it was interesting because Kirk Cousins was lined up differently than he has been all these years, and we got to see the start of his career and a lot of it here in Washington. In Washington. But, Tony, yeah. he wasn't moving. He had no movement. He could not avoid anything. And maybe they put him back there because just getting from under center to a five-step drop was too onerous for him coming off the torn Achilles. Yeah. And they should have known that. And if people actually use the preseason for what it's designed, they might have known that. But here's what you can do. You can go to Michael Penix Jr. as soon as halftime. And if he plays well, you can say, you know what? Let's just give Kirk a couple of weeks here to practice Is and get healthy? better because it wasn't it yes, wasn't anything yeah. near a whole a whole year. So let, let's see. Let's give him Mike, some time. He should have started on the PUP list anyway. The next two games don't look like wins. It's at Philadelphia on Monday night and at Kansas yeah, City yeah. next Sunday mm -hmm. night. The whole world will see what Cousins can do. If you go to 0-3, someone in that room is going to say, Let's switch. Yeah. We move now to college football and another conference realignment story. The Pac-12, which is down to the Pac-2, is about to become the Pac-6. The holdover schools, Washington State and Oregon State, will soon be joined by geographically reasonable teams. Boise State, Fresno State, Colorado State, and San Diego State. Wilvon, your reaction to this resurrection? I love it. I, I told you on the camera last spring that this was going to happen. I'm thrilled to see it happen. Look, here's what all the people who slurp college football and who are invested in hyping college football, including at this network, here's what they all either miss or ignore or don't get. College football is about, is tribal. It's as tribal as anything, any sport on earth. And people want to see their rivalries and their teams play teams they are familiar with. They don't want to see Stanford play at Iowa and at Minnesota, and at Purdue, and Indiana, and Northwestern. They don't. That's garbage. So, no, I keep hearing about, it's the greatest college for... No, it isn't. Because you got an entire region of the country, and it is growing fast. You got them saying, I don't want to see this junk. So, Stanford and Cal ought to be on the phone today getting the hell out of the ACC and going back west where they belong because the $20 million they're going to get for Pickley for Stanford is nothing for Stanford, a school no. that rich. Start this right now. It can't happen soon enough. This is a very good midterm correction that you made because you had Stanford going to Big Ten schools oh, when well, they're actually going to go to ACC that's schools. That's just as bad. Here, Same have you thing. noticed that all of the new teams, have you noticed that all of the new teams in the pack, whatever, are state teams? You know, so maybe they just ought to call the new conference pack state because you cannot call it the Pac-12, because there are six teams in it. Now, they want to get to eight. They want to get to eight for the possibility that they would then become the fifth major power conference and maybe, maybe get an automatic bid to the playoffs. So what they're looking at now, Mike, the other schools are Utah State, UNLV, Wyoming, New Mexico, and Air Force. So essentially what we're talking about is, you know, the Mountain West Conference with the two Pac-12 schools that nobody wanted. I've said this before on the show. I'll be brief about it. What happened to the Pac-12? This is the conference of Bill Walsh and John Champions. McKay and Get John rated. Robinson, John Wooden, Greed. Luke Olson, and now it is a smoldering Greed heap. Greed happened A smoldering to it. heap. That's what happened. Let's take a break. Coming up, a Bengals corner expresses doubt of C for those Stanford opponents. We'll also ask him why T.J. Watt and Michael Parsons stay so good, even his defense is schemed to stop them. I'll tell you this, Mike, what, with, with the new Pac-12, if they get into the playoff and they go 0-3 in the first three years, relegate them. Relegate them. Because these schools don't deserve an automatic. They don't. Let's get back into football with our great friend ESPN NFL and college football analyst Booger McFarlane wearing a shirt from Old Head in Ireland right on the peninsula Ooh. into the ocean. Sweet. Very nice. Just sweet. Let's start with this. The Bengals face the Chiefs on Sunday. Today, Bengals cornerback 
Uh, Cam Taylor Britt said of Chiefs rookie speedster Xavier Worthy, this is a quote, what he has. He goes, quote, speed, that's about it. He can run straight, can't do much else, unquote. <laughs> what a bomber quote that is. Is this how you see it? And if you were a teammate of Mr. Taylor Britt's, how would you react to him actually saying this? Well, first of all, that's not how I see it. That's like saying LeBron James is tall and all he can do is dunk. No, that's not the case. We know he is a very skillful player. And when you look at Xavier Worthy going back to his days at Texas, yes, he has the 4-2-1 speed. He can get vertical and take the top off the defense. But let's think about the first touch he got in the NFL. He took an end around and I'd be like, listen, buddy, if I were you, I would be quiet until you have to deal with this 4-2-1 speed. He's out. But he, he should be ready to cover that 4 2 1 speed. Ooh, he better be ready to back that up. Booger, I'm so happy that defenses are ahead of offenses, at least after a week. It makes me very happy. I'm sure it makes you happy too. And I'm wondering if you are seeing the tangible things, tangible reasons that defenses are ahead. The passing is down because defenses have adjusted. What are you seeing when you look at this dynamic? Well, there are a couple of adjustments. I, I think defensive coordinators now are starting to keep the safeties back, which keeps the play in front of you and force the, the, the quarterback to be accurate underneath. And I think also, let's just be honest, the quarterback play in week one was terrible. If you just look at passing yards overall, they were down. And I think that had a lot to do with guys coming out and not playing in the preseason. You look at a guy like Kirk Cousins, very rusty. Deshaun Watson looked like a shell of his former self. Those are veteran quarterbacks that you expect to show up and play in regular season form. And quite frankly, they did not. And I think offenses will slowly get their rhythm over the next couple of weeks. But yeah, defense ruled the nest week one. And I think as long as these defensive coordinators don't get frisky and start to blitz, passing yards are going to stay down because they're keeping all the coverage back and keeping the plays in front of them. I want to stay with defense for a second and ask you specifically about T.J. Watt and Micah Parsons, who are all over the place for their teams in, in week one. And, Booger, are they just unblockable, or are there adjustments to be made now that you expect to see? Because if people don't start getting the handle on them, they're going to wreck some offenses. You know what, Mike, think about this. We've seen great players in, in every sport, whether it's a great hitter, whether it's a great shooter in the NBA. If you're a great player, there's a reason you're great. You can get your shot. You can get your play anytime you want. And when you look at Parsons and you look at Watt, regardless of the attention you give them, at some point in the game, you're going to give them an open look. Okay, when they get that open look, they're going to take it. Regardless of how you run behind Steph Curry, regardless of what you do, at some point, he's going to get an open look, and the great players take advantage of the opportunities. You may hold them down for one, two, maybe even three quarters, but at some point, Michael Parsons and T.J. Watt are going to take the game over, and it's tough to scheme against them because you have defensive coordinators that can move them around, especially in Dallas now when you look at Mike Zimmer, the new coordinator. They can move Michael Parsons around off the edge or a linebacker, and so it's going to be really tough. Regardless of how you scheme those two guys, they're going to make their plays because they're just great players. Uh, we will get you out of here on this, and it is a college question. Colorado quarterback Shadour Sanders, he could be, people say, the number one pick in the draft, but he's playing behind a really yeah. bad offensive line. If you're Dion, your dad, at what point do you try to save your son for something in the future? I think you have to take a look at when the season is, is on the line. So as long as Colorado is in bowl contention, I think you're going to trust Shadur out there as long as he's healthy. If it gets toward the end of the season and there's two or three games left, and there's really no mathematical way that Colorado can get to a bowl. Because let's face it, Dion needs to get this team to a bowl this year. I don't know if he can, but as long as he's bowl, getting close to bowl eligibility, he's going to have to play his son. But the moment that goes away, and there's a couple games left, he's got to go into dad mode. He's got to step away from coach mode and say, okay, I'm going to go into dad mode. And does it, does, it, does it matter to my son to go out and play these last two games? Or should I allow him to kind of sit out and get ready for the NFL draft. I think dad prime and coach prime have to have a conversation at that point. Well said. Thank you so much. Appreciate Booger, it, as always. Thank you. Anytime, guys. Let's take one last break still to come. Is it Bowden Francis or Bowden Francis of the Blue Jays? 
Look for a pronunciation there. Loses a no-no in the ninth again. Okay, Asia Wilson didn't get 40 as I predicted, but she set a new WNBA no, she... record in a win over the Fever. Fever been on a roll, yeah, I not, think that... not once they got a hold of Bowden. Asia Wilson. I'm told it's Bowden. Like I want to make college. sure of that. Bowden like in right? Bobby like Bowden. Like college. Yeah. Bowden. Not... Today, Mickey Lowlich. History lesson, kids. In 1968, pitchers ruled the major leagues. The two best pitchers were Bob Gibson of the Cardinals, who had a remarkable 1.12 ERA, and Denny McLean of the Tigers, who had a remarkable 31 wins. Neither of those numbers has been approached since because baseball lowered the mound after that season to prevent it. But at the end of the season, the star pitcher was Mickey Lolich. Lolich outshone Gibson and McLean in the World Series, where he won three games over the Cardinals, including Game 7 over Gibson. Lolich threw three complete games, Duh. 27 innings with a 167 ERA. He won Game 7 on two days rest. Tony, I know all the other sports make persuasive cases that they are better now than they were 30, 40, 60, 70 years ago. I don't want to hear that from baseball because it doesn't have the component we're talking about now with a guy like Lolich who a couple of years later went 25 and 14 with 29 complete games. And he's the number two guy on your staff after yeah. Denny McClain. Come on now. Yeah. Baseball doesn't have anything like that. It is not better. Happy anniversary, Tony Gonzalez. On this day, 14 years ago, while playing for the Falcons, Gonzalez caught two passes against the Steelers to become the first tight end in NFL history to reach 1,000 career receptions and the seventh receiver overall to do it. Only one other tight end has gone over 1,000 catches, Jason Witten, with 1,228. That's 97 behind Gonzalez. Antonio Gates is third all-time with 955 receptions. The active leader is Travis Kelsey with 910. At 35, Kelsey seems like a reasonable bet to break 1,000. Rob Gronkowski, who I think is the best tight end ever, at 621 catches. Yeah, see, it's not going to be just catches for you or me. Here I go be an old man again. If I had to take a tight end out of all the tight ends that have played and my life was on the line and I'm playing a game tonight, I'm taking Ozzie Newsom. I'm just saying. And there are a lot of great tight ends out there. And wow, this seems to be the age of the great tight end right now. Yes. Still going yes. to Ozzie. Ozzie. I agree pen. with that. Bring him out the pen. Happy trails to another no hitter for Bowden Francis. The Blue Jays starter took a no-hitter into the ninth for the second time in four starts. And just like last time, he lost it by surrendering a home run to start the ninth, this time to Francisco Lindor of the Mets. It was one of six runs the Mets scored in the frame to win the game. Wilvon, you hate when managers let pitch counts get I in the do. way of potential history. But Francis was at 111 pitches, and he said, quote, with that many pitches, I felt like I had to empty the tank with heaters and let him put the ball in play, unquote. This whole thing, what you just talked about, was very noteworthy. But, Tony, this Frankie Lindor for MVP thing, it seems to be gathering momentum. I know Shohei goes out there and seems to hit a home run every night. Hit one against my Cubs last night. He's going to get the 50-50. But, Tony, a guy plays elite defense at the level of Lindor, and, and his team is in it, and he's leading his team in it, and they've been about the best team for the last 80 games, about the best record in that time. We may have to revisit that. I know you don't want to. I'm not revisiting. May have to revisit. I'm not. All right. I'm not. I'm willing to at least time. think about it. I'm not. We'd also like to note the passing of Hall of Fame Lions linebacker Joe Schmidt at the age of 92. Mm. Schmidt led the Lions to two titles. He was all pro eight times. He made 10 consecutive Pro Bowls. He also coached the Lions for five seasons. Wilbon, you love middle linebackers, yes. and Schmidt was one of the best. Yes. Yes, Tony. He was one of the best at a time where middle linebackers were seemingly the most important people. It wasn't edge rusher. It was middle linebackers like Schmidt. And that, those are the last two championships Detroit won. He was hoping That's that right. he they would live long enough to maybe see the Lions get into a Super Bowl, and it didn't happen. One correction, the Falcons' next two games are at the Eagles and then home for the Chiefs, not at the Chiefs. That's my bad. Uh, let's go to the big finish. Let's do it. Asia Wilson. At 27 points and a win over the Fever to break the WNBA single-season scoring record, do you find that significant? No. The fact that she's the best player in the league and the MVP, that's significant. Shohei Otani, speaking of, now has a career high in home runs, 47 as I just mentioned. Is that a big deal?
not necessarily just the 47, but if he goes 50-50 like you said he would, that is a, a, an enormous deal, and he's the unanimous MVP, 50-50. Not unanimous. James Maybe Paxton not. told the Baseball Isn't Boring podcast that he thinks he'll retire after the season. Does that make sense to you? Tony, 35 years old with a lot of injuries, including right now with a calf. I, if he wants to go, if he said enough, I get it. The Phillies swept the Rays in our season high, 30 games over 500. You love the Phillies. Go ahead. I do. They're really good. The best one through nine order in baseball. Last one, Solheim Cup starts tomorrow. He did an event about it last night. Who's going to win it? Yeah, Tony. I think the United States coming off a couple of losses in the tie is going to win. And you know I'm rooting for my faves. Nelly Corda, Lexi Thompson, Andrew Lee. I'm just saying, I might go out there to watch. Might you? Expect you. I expect you to go to RTJ. Okay. We played RTJ, it a number of times. Of course you go. We're out of Love time. It. We're trying to do better the next time. I'm Tony Kornheiser. I'm Mike Wilbon. Same time tomorrow, Knucklehead. You can get the PTI podcast on the ESPN app or Apple Podcast. Shout out to everybody who's here for the Soul Hunt. That is really cool. Here's sports. You're going to get a limousine out there? The latest woman to accuse Deshaun Watson of sexual assault in a civil lawsuit will meet with the NFL in the next two weeks, according to her attorney, Tony Busby. Watson is accused of assaulting the woman at her apartment before a dinner date in October of 2020 when he was still on the Texans. Busby said that he'll be presenting video evidence and two additional witnesses. Watson has denied the allegations. He settled 23 lawsuits alleging sexual assault in 2022 and then was suspended 11 months by the NFL. Browns head coach Kevin Stefanski said Watson will start Sunday against the Jaguars and wouldn't comment on the lawsuit. Senior NFL insider Adam Schefter joins us now. Shefty, what more can you tell us about the NFL's investigation into this new civil lawsuit against Watson? Kevin, as you mentioned, the NFL is going to be talking to the accuser in about two weeks. And the NFL is reviewing this situation under its personal conduct policy, as it would with any particular case of this magnitude. It is not going to place Deshaun Watson on the commissioner's exempt list. There are no plans to currently do that. And when he had a settlement with the NFL the last time for the prior instances, basically he had to disclose everything that happened. So I think in this particular case, the league is going to look to see whether this particular situation not only is accurate and stands up, but whether Deshaun Watson said anything about it to the league the last time. That's something that the league will look into when it talks to this particular accuser. We'll see what the league determines, but it is reviewing the situation under its personal conduct policy. On the field, Watson and the Browns looking to avoid losing the first two games of the season for the first time since 2017. Adam, thank you. Still to come on Sports Center. Our I, but we're still doing some reflecting as well as we get ready for the Bengals and Chiefs after their stunning upset at the hands of the Patriots. The Bengals looking to avoid starting 0-2 for the fifth time in the last six seasons. Certainly won't be easy because they play the defending champs in Kansas City on Sunday. The bright side here, Joe Burrow 3-1 all-time against Patrick Mahomes. But that, of course, is a Joe Burrow that doesn't have injury concerns. Adam Schefter is back with us. What are you hearing, Shefty, about the level of concern surrounding Joe Burrow's health and that wrist? Well, a lot of speculation about him moving that wrist on Sunday. Camera angles continue to show him moving that wrist. Now, Joe Burrow has said that that's something that is planned. It's nothing out of the ordinary. He's moving that wrist after having the wrist surgery last year when he hurt it in a Thursday night game against the Baltimore Ravens, and it's nothing unusual. He says it is not a factor, that that's not why he played the way he did on Sunday, and the opportunities were there. Look, the bottom line is whether the wrist is healthy or not, they need him and the offense to be better than they were this Sunday in Kansas City against the Chiefs. It's a game in which they're unlikely to have their wide receiver, T. Higgins, who's dealing with a hamstring injury and hasn't practiced the last two days. We saw Burrow flexing the wrist. He says it's not a problem. I guess the truth of the matter will come out when we watch them play on Sunday in Kansas City. Yeah, and by the way, Shefty, got to throw this out there, that if he is held in check on Sunday, it might not necessarily be injury-related. Burrow's been held without a passing touchdown in three of his last four September games. As for Burrow's star receiver, he made some pretty interesting comments today. Listen to Jamar Chase. Yeah, 100%. Everybody knows that, bro. It's not, it's not no if, you know what I'm saying? We, we, we are the team to be in the AFC, and we know it, and we got to act like it, and we got to play like it, too. <laughs> I 
listen, I, do you put it in the world and then you believe it? I, I just, they have shown no accountability that, that this team is the best team in the AFC. Well, you know, this always goes against, like, are you giving the Chiefs bulletin board material? Yes. What do you expect Jamar Chase to say? We are going to be outclassed by Kansas City? No, I get that. I get that. But to say we're the best in the AFC? Yeah. Ooh, well, one of Chase's teammates taken specific aim at the Chiefs, and that is rookie Xavier Worthy here in his NFL debut last week. What did Xavier Worthy bring to this KC offense that you guys need to be prepared for? That's about it. He can run straight. Run jet sweeps and just run straight. We can't do too much else, so that's about it. Feel like you put your hands on him. He's only. Ooh, Marcus Spears back with us here. Uh, Swagoo, it feels like you're poking the bear there, or is that the right mentality you need to beat the Chiefs? Which one is it? First of all, let me say this, Kev. I love it because I'm petty, okay? <laughs> and I think it makes for great fodder in the NFL. But you know you're not just poking the bear when it comes to Kansas City. See, here's what players forget. This is what Cam Taylor Britt forgot. He forgot that Andy Reid is calling plays and that Patrick Mahomes is the quarterback. This is never a – didn't have any playmaker. So, I think it's poking the bear. It gets personal. I like the talk because we know Xavier Worthy is a rookie and you want to see how he's going to respond. But I got a great feeling that this game plan with that speed is going to be tailored to making sure that Xavier Worthy makes some plays. So if Cam Taylor Brick can say it, yeah. now you got to back it well, up. You're writing checks, too, for that offense. And we got to see if that offense and their quarterback is healthy. Joe Burrow, keep in mind, 3-1 and one in his career against yeah. Patrick Mahomes, including the postseason. It is Marcus Petty Spears here with us. Just ahead, how Josh Allen and the Bills are keeping the offense in stride despite the loss of Stephon Diggs. Dan Orlovsky explains ahead. So, Kevo, yesterday I'm watching Asia Wilson make more history against the Fever. She set the record for the most points in a WNBA season. And I tweeted, imagine being a two-time league MVP, mm -hmm. a two-time champ, mm -hmm. and a finals MVP and still finding a way to level up. Just gets better every time yeah. we see her, right? That's exactly 